And LeBron James and Mila Kina, and that's what the crowd was waiting for. Oh, Canada oh, doing some mountain. Canada oh, that in my house. It yeah. is Canada. You knew he was going to mouth off at some point. Canada's Here we go. Canada started the whole thing. Yeah. And you said before the game he's mouthy. Here yeah, we go. He's mouthy, yes. Mr. Tough Guy. We have a double foul. We're going to have a technical foul as well. Maybe double text. Cannon is outspoken because of LeBron's comments the other night. Neil Kinney got involved or in front of LeBron. They gave him a little shove. In a little shove. Oh, man. And here comes the police force. Right. Oh, look at this, Cannon. He's this tall. Right. I'm not, I'm not that short. He really is this tall. 6'11". I'm, I'm glad we get to sit down, but they, they, right. were, they, were, they, were, they were asking me, do you want us to get us uh, something to bolster you up? But they used to do that in restaurants with like white pages. The white pages are gone. Right. Um, so, Ennis, there are, there are people in the audience who yes. don't, like my friend Andy, who probably doesn't watch that much basketball. Okay. Um, tell me... I mean, you're, you're a famous basketball player. How, how did this passion start? How did you get involved in that? So I'm from Turkey, like you guys see it. I actually didn't want to be a basketball player. I started with soccer. It's the number one sport in, a, in my country, Turkey. I uh, started playing soccer when I was, you know, seven, eight years old, and I wanted to be a soccer player. But just because of I was very tall, they would keep putting me in a goalkeeper. They said, hey, you know, you can catch good balls. I'm like, come on, man. This is so boring here. I'm not, I don't want to be here. <laughs> And, uh, and then I started playing basketball, because I was the tallest one in my class. And then I was like, you know what? I'm really good at it. I think I'm going to try to be a basketball player. And uh, since then, I'm, I'm playing basketball. And this, this started where? In your, 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 what, what, how old were you? When you um, I think I was like around 13, 14 years old in Ankara, capital of uh, Turkey. So I started playing there when I was 13, 14 years old. I was the, you know, I don't want to sound cocky, but I was the, the best in my team. And, uh, and then I was, after that, you know, I stopped playing. I was really good at it. And then, you know what? I was like, you know what? I'm going to try for NBA. And then that's why I came here. And this, <clears throat> but this, this, this was encouraged in your school? Uh, it was, yes. It was one of the Hizmet schools in, uh, in Ankara. And then, you know, my coaches, actually, my family didn't want me to play basketball. They were all about education. I'm like, Mom, Dad, I want to I wanna go to school, of course. But at the same time, I want to play basketball. And they did not want me. And then after I signed my first NBA contract, I was like, you know what? Good job. <laughs> you know, I was like, you did a good job. I was like, thank you, mom. <laughs> so the, these schools, yep. his met. I mean, this is a, a subject of um, some controversy. Mm -hmm. Uh, tell me about the Hizmet schools, the schools you were in as a child. Well, the Hizmet, let me explain the Hizmet first. Hizmet means the Turkish, it's, it's serve. It's a, you know... To serve. It means serve. Serve. Yes. It's a global social movement and focuses on a secular education and fighting with poverty, inspired by an Islamic uh, scholar, uh, Mr. Fethullah Gülen, who follows Sufi tradition. And he inspired millions of people to open, uh, you know, uh, modern and secular uh, uh, school relief organizations. So his, his met is a secular schooling thing that, that has this kind of Sufi Muslim yes. tradition. got it right. Okay. Now, his met is how you became an activist. Uh, actually, yes. And when I become an activist, I mean, uh, I'll tell you a little more about it later, but uh, it started actually uh, in 2013 mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, it was a big corruption attempt in, in, in Turkey. And, uh, it was a big cor corruption. Corruption. Corruption, yes. And it was in, uh, uh, it was the December 17th, 25th. And, you know, I was, I tweeted something about it and I see the reaction. Because just because I'm a basketball player, when I tweet something, when I say, say something, it becomes a conversation and it goes viral. You know, just some people loved it, some people But what it. were you tweeting? How did, how did this begin? Um, it was, you know, the, the president, the, uh, Erdogan, the Turkish president, was closing uh, schools, and um, prep schools. Well, you know, his thing was, you know, he wants people to follow him blindly. So that's why his education was his number one enemy. So that's why, I mean, this, he, uh, just because he wanted to establish his dictatorship, uh, he, doesn't want, he doesn't want anybody, anyone to think. He, anyone to, he wants yes men around him, and he just said, you know what, I'm closing all this, you know, the uh, educational institutions. So the president was closing the Hizmet schools. Yes. And you tweeted. 
Actually, let me tell you this too. His sons and his daughter went to these schools. So his children, the dictator's children, children went yes. to the same schools. Same schools, and now he's closing them. I'm like, this is weird. But you, you, you met him. I actually have a photo of you with the dictator. Him. Yes, there you go. This is actually 2011. That was my, um, uh, I was playing na Turkish national team uh, with the senior team. Uh, I just got drafted here by Utah Jazz, third pick. And uh, I went back to Turkey and played national team. Okay, so you were in the Turkish national team. So what happens? You tweet against the president? You tweet, what, what, what happens? See, like when I say something, when I say something about Turkey, don't get me wrong, I love my country. I love my flag, I love my people. My problem is with the regime in Turkey. My problem is with the, what's going on with the government in Turkey. Uh, what they do, and I think, you know, it was, it's just really sad that, you know, just all those people out there, what, what's going through. And then I'm like, I've been to this school since second grade. I'm like, come on, man, this is not right. And then if you're fighting against an education, if you're fighting against, if you're going out there and shutting down schools, this is, this is no, no. So you tweet, mm -hmm. and what then? Ooh, then, you know, some people loved it. Some people said, you know, just shut up and dribble the ball. You don't need to be getting these conversations. And I was like, you know what? God gave me this platform. I play in an NBA, and when I tweet something, when I say something, it goes viral, it goes everywhere. And I was like, you know what? Why not just help people? Why not just help innocent people? Why not just go use it in a good cause? So that's why I become a more activist and more uh, talk, talk, talk about these issues. And what have been the consequences of your activism? Man, I was, it was a lot because, I mean, um, now I can't even go back to my country. Actually, um, it's very sad that it just, uh, I'm an NBA basketball player. It's very weird. I played in the New York Knicks, right? It's maybe the, one of the biggest teams in, uh, in NBA. They don't show my team games in Turkey. They ban my games in Turkey. Yes, they ban my, all my games. So the, all the New York fans, Actually, I was in Oklahoma too. So we made the Western Conference Finals. We made the Western with Russell Westbrook, Kevin Durant. You guys, you know these guys. And they banned all of my games. Like, and all the Turkish fans are like, we hate Dennis because we want to watch Russell Westbrook. You know, it was so weird. Now, your, your case is somewhat different to the usual activist in Turkey. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, how does that contrast with the usual people who are actually on the front lines in Turkey and not having the kind of profile that you have? It's very sad because the people know my story because I play an NBA. If I tweet something or if, they like, if I do an interview, people know my story. But the other side, there is millions of people that they don't even know their story. You know, there is a thousands and thousands. Of, my dad was a genetic pro pro professor. He just got fired and just, because of, just because of me. And now my mom can't even go outside of the streets because they spit on his face or my sister or my brothers can even, you know, just, uh, they cannot find a job because they are reality to, to me. So I think, you know, it's just, there are a million people out there who's waiting for help, who's, you know, uh, my thing is, people are asking me like, why are you doing that? Your family's still back in Turkey. And I'm saying, hey, you know what? What I'm doing is way bigger than basketball, way bigger than NBA. I am trying to be the voice of all those innocent people out there who don't have a voice. So that was, that was my thing. Now, tell us about the persecution in Turkey. Oh, well, I mean, it's, it's tough, you know, because, um, well, if I ever go back to Turkey, then, you know, they, I have a rest warning for like four years, and then my teammates are like, you have a rest warning? You're a mid basketball player. I said, I know. And then whenever I walk in the locker room, they look at me like, are you okay? I'm like, don't worry about it, man. I'm used to this stuff. And, um, you know, I think my dad has a you know, trial uh, this month, and I just want you to guys um, pray for him and pray for everybody. And it's just, it's very tough to just uh, see what all these people are going through. And uh, so, for instance, the president of Turkey mm -hmm. has imprisoned more journalists uh, currently any than in the world. any other government yep. in the world. Most people don't realize just how bad the repression is well, in that, Turkey. Well, that shows that there is no freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, you, if you don't put in journalists in a jail, I mean, that's their job to talk and write. And if you put them in a jail, man, they're like, come on, like that, that, that's not right, because that's his job. You, either you're gonna like it or you're not gonna like it. This is, that, that's their job. So that's why, I mean, I pray for all those people, man, because they're journalists, that, that's their job, that's what they're doing. And then the crazy thing is, so a lot of the journalists are out, out of the country. So if they cannot catch the uh, people who's outside the country, they catching their uh, family members. 
and saying, if you, uh, you better stop uh, tweeting or we're just going to put your family in jail. And that's very crazy. Do you have a sense of how many political prisoners there are in Turkey? Oof. Over, man, probably over 150,000. Right. Yes. And, and many of them are involved in the same movement that you were part of, the, the educational movement. Not just that. There are a lot of babies out there, hundreds and hundreds of babies, because that's what they're with their mom. And there is a lot of over, I think it was like 15 or 17,000 women are in the jail waiting for help. Those are women, man. Like, why are you touching the women? That's, that, it was just, it's just pretty crazy. I actually um, remember reading a case that I thought was rather indicative, because rather than just statistics, if you, can, um, if you can humanize a case by just showing the level of repression that exists, uh -huh. There was uh, a, um, a doctor who on Facebook put what he thought was a kind of funny um, lampooning uh, of the president. I actually a have a slide here. Um, he compared <laughs> the dictator of Turkey. <laughs> At the time, he was not a fully-fledged dictator. Yep. He was hollowing out the democracy slowly, and he compared it to Gollum. He compared him to Gollum. Kind of looks like him, though, right? He <laughs> kind of looks like him. Well, he, he put the, well, any, anything, anytime someone makes fun of power, yep. that is a healthy thing for a society. Of course. Because yeah. the outcome should be laughter, right. not fear. And in the case of this guy, what, do, do you remember what happened to this guy? I think he was arrested. Oof. He was arrested. I'll tell you a couple more stories. So I'm a basketball player, right? I'm a NBA basketball player. And I, got, I took a lot of pictures. I signed a lot of stuff. Shoes, jerseys, T-shirts. So I saw a case that uh, I saw on uh, Twitter that I, they found a picture. That there's this guy took a picture with me, and they found on his phone, and now he's in jail. Yes. And there's a fan again, and I, I signed his shoes and give it to him. And when they come to raid at his house, they find the shoes. I mean, it's a very pretty big shoes, like size 17 or something. So he, can, he cannot hide it. So <laughs> the police found it, of course. And uh, he asked, whose shoes is this? Well, he cannot lie. It's a size 17 shoes. Um, well, I think he has an arrest warning now. I think he's trying to escape the, uh, escape the country. And, if I, and now he's an arrest warning. I mean, those, it, it's pretty ugly and it's very funny. Well, it's, uh, it's certainly sad. I am... Um I noticed, I, I learned today that uh, the president of Turkey will be coming to New York in a few days. In a few days, yep. He'll be here, I think, the, the 23rd? Uh, to, throughout the 27th, maybe, I think. From the 23rd to the 27th. I think so, yep. What, what, um, what message do you have? I mean, what can those of us in this room do? How can we help? How can we be of assistance? Uh, well, I think I want to think from you guys. Uh, the one thing, I mean, there is, you can show it with the slide too, and there is, you, can, you guys can u use a hashtag. A hashtag. A hashtag called, also it's on, you guys, on Twitter, is that Erdogan is out. Erdogan out. Erdogan out. Erdogan yeah, out. Erdogan out. And then the second one, um, it's a pretty crazy story. I mean, you guys have been hearing a lot of crazy stories, not just for me, and for all the guy, other people just who comes and speak here. I just want you to, you know, just put your hand on your heart and just pray for them. That's the, that's the one thing I want from you guys because I want your prayer, I want your energy. Because some of the people going through what I'm going through and everything, it's, there is a million people out there like that. So I just want you to, uh, the most important thing I want from you guys, just put your hand on your heart, just pray for them. Because it means a lot. It seriously means a lot. Well, the, the persecution that um, we've been discussing that is rather real for the people inside Turkey, mm -hmm. in, in your case, it's, it's been, you know, the New York Times covered yep. when they canceled your passport. Yep. Um, I, I also read somewhere that you, they tried to kidnap you. Yes, they did. Uh, well, I was doing my uh, basketball camp with my foundation all over the world, and I was in Indonesia. And uh, the Indonesia, the intelligence service and the army tried to uh, come there and kidnap me. And um, we actually escaped the country, uh, went to Singapore. And it was, it was scary. It was very scary. But, um, and then I went to Romania, canceled my passport, and then, then it became very viral. 
But it just, it's just sad because when you <coughs> put all this stuff out there, uh, you know, there are, you know, some people are going to love it and some pe people are going to hate it. And then this is what the haters does. You know, I mean, uh, well, I want to talk about that too. I've been getting, you know, at least like three, four death threats a week. Mm. I mean, those are death threats. It doesn't matter from social media or somewhere else. Those are death threats. But I'm a basketball player. I have a lot of security around me, a lot of assistants, a lot of managers around me. But just think about this. There are a lot of, sorry, they have a, a lot of people out there who don't have security. A lot of people out there who don't have managers. So, I mean, there are around 80, 80 people uh, already been kidnapped from, you know, Pakistan, Malaysia, and I think Kosovo uh, by that, you know, the government, the Turkish government. So it's just very sad to just uh, see what people are going through, man. So Aragon does indeed have this thing where he wants to terrify his own people so much that he finds his opponents in other countries, ransoms them, kidnaps them, and brings them back. We just saw a case of this at the Human Rights Foundation where several teachers in his Met were kidnapped in Moldova and within a question of hours, without a trial, were sent back to Turkey. That's a way of him showing, I have the power. And let me tell you something, when they sent him to Turkey, it's very ugly. And it's, they've been getting kidnapped, they've been getting tortured, they've been getting, you know, just killed in jails. And it's, it's very ugly. And I know uh, somehow if they ever send me back to Turkey, if this would happen, Romania, they would have sent me back to Turkey, the second day you guys wouldn't hear ever, for, uh, ever you guys wouldn't hear ever, a word from me ever again. So it's, it's a very ugly uh, situation. Well, so now you know it's hashtag Aragon out, and we always like to tell him in social media, you are not welcome here. You're certainly not welcome in New York. Ennis Cantor, thank you very much for your time and for you giving us a sense of certainty. That's it. Yeah. Thank you.